Yesterday's concert is a proud member of the Pantheon Media Network. We had light come from the sky. And in the sky, through our own unconscious contents and desires, we were able to look into the sky and form symbols out of certain spots of light. A spotlight is emulative of a star. A star stands in the man-made stage that is a spotlight. But the way that exists in nature, which is also how it exists in my unconscious, is that oftentimes stars can be part of the constellation. And then it's actually fascinating because you find yourself looking at constellations more so than you do singular stars. If you're anything like me, when you find yourself in the state of awe under a, a great Tennessee night sky, you use singular stars to find your way to a constellation. So that's the whole concept with the band is that it's a collective of stars. It's a constellation and we all shine brightly. And whenever the moon that is of the present moment and where the sun is, which is the song, wherever those two are in tandem with each other, which is ever changing, certain parts of the constellation shine differently than others. But at the end of the day, it's a collective of stars and it's a platform. Welcome concert goers, music fanatics, and cosmic country believers. My name is Lance Ingram, and in this encore episode of Yesterday's Concert, Daniel Donato talks philosophy, the Grateful Dead, and deep groove jamming. Grab your earplugs, because we're about to get heady. Today we're talking to Daniel Donato, an astronaut country shredder. We're not only going to talk to Daniel about his journey, but we're also going to learn a little bit about cosmic country. So Daniel, welcome to the show, man. Thank you for having me. All right. So to get started, we're just going to do our rapid fire Q&A that we typically do. So Daniel, first question, how old were you at your first gig? Ooh, good question. Even though it's rapid fire, I I just want to make bandwidth available for the listener in the case that my Bluetooth connection out here on tour is a little latent. So it, it, rapid might be flexible. I was, uh, I was, I was 15 when I played my first paid show, 15 years old. Okay. So what's a country music guitar riff that we, you wish you had written? Chattahoochee. Oof, that's fire, man. Good answer. What is a Grateful Dead guitar riff that you wish you had wrote? Find a cat sunflower. Oh man, dude, I'm falling in love with you. Keep going. Both of them, both. Both Jerry's part and Bob's part, um, both of them. So like the one that starts on boom, down, to do down, Jerry's part, and then the who da 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 Bob's part. Like I couldn't have the capacity to write both of those. That'd be another level of musicianship. I, I could honestly just sit here and listen to you sing the guitar parts to me, and that would be good enough for me. <laughs> so we could just we could do that. <laughs> All right. So you get to jam with any band you want to. Who do you sit in with? I would say Alive, uh, either Chris Stapleton's band or Fish. Nice. And then Dead, I would say Buck Owens with John Rich, that band. Then I would say like Fillmore West with the Dead. Oof. Like in the early 70s or Winterland, somewhere around there before before 74. Dude. Like, um, or, or 74 or 74, yeah. Any any particular song you want to do China Cat or you want to you want to do something else? Hmm. Good question. I would say I would love to do They Love Each Other and um, Scarlet Fire would be fun. Scarlet Fire would probably be really fun, actually. I'm, even though that's predictable. Well, that's already in your repertoire, man. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I say. That's in your repertoire. You gotta, you gotta mix it up, man. Come on. I know. I know. That's the whole deal. I mean, honestly, I, I think I would just go for whatever they wanted me to play in because that would be like, that's really like the song of the moment. You know, like that's the philosophy of what they were doing, and just to embrace the situation as the boss that Steve mentions on Long Strange Trip, Steve Parrish, I think. Um, you know, it's like situation so whatever situation if you put in with whatever song would be oh i think dire wolf would be fun dire wolf would be a great one you know i had that in the back of, i had that in the back of my head for you but i wasn't going to say it so i'm glad you said it <laughs> like, i think you'd be perfect for that one yeah for sure it's like or you know you could get into like with the wit and Marsalis, um when he sat in on like eyes 
Yeah. In the nineties at giant stadium. Yeah. Yeah. Like eyes would be good, but that would require me to, um, play with the dead in the nineties, which would be different than playing with them in the seventies. Yeah. But yeah, I totally agree. I think, I think you'd fit better in the seventies with them. That early seventies phase. Me I think too. you'd be right there with them. It was man. such a different band. You know, it was such a different band. It was, it, was, it really was. Yeah. It was a different Jerry. Yes. And, you know, everything I say about that, you know, I'm saying that with, like, anyone who got to see Jerry, like, trust me, I know I was born in 1995 and I never got to see him. Like, trust me, I know. <laughs> but it's like, I've, I've been around music and close enough to it long enough to know that, like, there's niche parts of the pie chart that are all genres of music that my soul connects with. And it was, it's simply like a a twist of space and time that I was born at that time. If I was born 30 years earlier, 40 years earlier, I would have been there buying a $2 ticket and like, you know, a Budweiser for 75 cents. Or whatever <laughs> <I want. laughs> to get in, you know, it was like, I, re- I really would. So, yeah. Well, but I mean, at least, at least we got the, you know, streaming. I mean, it's everywhere. Archive has like every show ever. So, I mean, at least we still got it today. I mean, may not have Jerry, but at least we still have his memory. Yeah, and and we have the part of him that he was channeling, which I think is like, in terms of just great American artists, I would have to maintain similar stance with Bob Dylan by saying, Jerry, Mm. you know, he said, Bob said he's the best. I I don't like to speak in definitive terms like that. Because like, I have a really hard time with with my, like, I'm very self-critical. So like, if I find myself evolving to an opinion that is counter to what I would, uh, have previously stated I'm, I'm not fair in debating with myself i try to not say like someone's the best or the worst or it's like i do but i would say jerry was like he really was like the definitive american artist like it's every it's every aspect of america it's the free market because you have shakedown street and it's capitalism because you have a growing enterprise and it's in a good way not in like a make your workers withhold restroom break to work in a tornado storm way it's like capitalism in a good way it's like it's democracy because there really never was like one opinion to where everyone deferred to even though it obviously was leading towards sherry to be that guy there was always friction looking back on the documentaries and reading immense amounts of interviews everything really was coming down to him but he wasn't accepting but it's like and then you also have like the uh the genre pool that they were pulling from. They have blues, they have ragtime, they have country, they have jazz, the different varying forms of rock and roll that start with greatest story ever told, Johnny Be Good to Big River, you know, Sun Records, um, you know, those old early country recordings. Like it's just definitively American. And then like the whole concept of touring as an odyssey. And going out into the country that you're from to discover not only the country, but yourself. And it's like, that was, that was a big part of the entire trip there. It's still alive. It's still going. And so like, to, like circle back to the concept with uh, Terry being gone, and then he being here in some better way. His job as the artist is to really get that close to the muse and channel it into the present moment. And we have these artifacts of recording that are like low resolution passports into like the the chasm of the immersion that the present moment would have had and that's like the thing i I legitimately get that about not being able to go and listen be at some of the shows i listen to all the time like the terrapin 1977 to, to hear that 16 minute sugary my god like i yeah i'm just bummed i can't go see it you know but Jerry, like in the best way possible, like I've and anyone I've ever been touched by, he really like was able to channel the thing, the the force that exists outside of space and time, bring it into space and time, and then live on after his physical being is gone from space and time. He was it. That's beautiful, man. But yeah, I mean, I'm gonna bypass the remaining questions that I had because I want to jump right into what you said talking about not being able to define a definitive best then what do you have to strive towards if there's not a best to be achieved what keeps pushing you then i would say a vision i would say vision is the thing because it's like 
something that's very interesting that I've recently come into like a head-on collision with is the difference between like a vision and a goal. And when I was young, I had a lot of the times goals are like external world-based triumphs to be the best at something by gaining a ma- like a badge of honor, a medal of honor, like Forrest Gump did, you know, or something like um, having the most um, shows at Live well, Auditorium or like being called like the best guitar player in the world or like something that's like externally world born. I think the thing that would keep you striving is the thing that actually lives on and grows once you achieve it. So like a goal, once you have a goal, once you have it, you have it. There's nowhere else to go. There's nowhere else to go. But a vision is a moving target. It's something that keeps perpetuating in front of you, just like a long highway driving from one gig to the next. There's always more road, more road that's unseen and it asks something different of you. That's when you really start to get into the psyche of the people who are the top percentage of what they did in whatever domain it is. They really arrive after having had a Swiss Army knife of goals under their belt. They arrive at realizing that a lot of the time it was vision that was pushing them. And then after you reach so much, you just keep getting vision. I think so. I would say vision. That's more so than an external world goal. But it's interesting too, especially with playing guitar, there is no in goal per se, like there is no complete mastery of it. Like you will always continue to be learning something about the instrument. Yeah. You know, and I, I've read an interview or heard an interview or something where you were saying you wanted to be the best guitar picker in Nashville or the best country guitar picker ever. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, obviously your opinion has shifted a little bit in that. It sounds like. No, I still want that. I, I still do, but it's the thing where it's not, it's not the only thing I'm striving for. And what it was, was a realization several that was um, somewhere to the tune of like, well, what, what is the voice that is creating those goals? And maybe that's the mm. thing for us to respond to. So the vision is the river, the goal or the fish that you catch out of it. You know what I mean? It's like you showing up every day to go and catch the fish or sip and get the gold like people out west did in the early days of the country. It's like, that's a thing. And so I have both now. And that also like reinforces something that I didn't always have in my mind, which is that it's a feast, not a famine. And that's like really like flex seal duct tape applicable to so many perspectives that I have that I arrive at the things with them. It's like the feast's not a fan. And that's another wise thing that I've been able to integrate through my loop stubble when I was 14. Can you can you elaborate a little bit more about what you mean on feast and famine? Are you talking about there's enough enough to go around or can you just elaborate on that for me? So it's the idea of answering the question where it's, I had this opinion, uh, I had a goal of like to be called the best. It's like, I think everyone wants that. I think that's because what the best means is that there's a, there's, a, there's an activation of the hero that's latent within your psyche and your heart and soul. And that, that's actually a really good thing to get you to hit rubber on the road to have a goal. But once you have a lot of miles under that, I start to realize that it's, it's actually a voice that's creating those goals, a voice that is me in a place that is no space and time, not one that's so much like my ego and where I'm at here today in my physical body. And that's the thing I'm serving. And a, a distillation from that voice is also that it's like feast or famine. It's like feast, not famine. So you can have both. You know, you can have the goals, you can achieve the goals, and then you can have more. So you can keep going, you can keep growing. But what it is, it's not a game of trying to get the most goals. On the medals of how you play the game is that you try to compound on the percentage that you were. The feast over famine thing is ultimately like, like you can have goals and you can keep achieving things. Like one goal I had was to play a hundred shows with a band that I thought was timeless and transcendent, or that had the, and had the potential to achieve that. And it was a band of amazing stars, and it, we we exist like a constellation. And then it's like, sure enough, this year, like in this band, as I sit with you here, like we're about to, we're on track to play 140 shows this year. Everyone that's in the band right now, Noah, Nathan, and Will, are stars to my constellation, to our constellation. And it's like, I'm realizing the thing that creates those goals is like a solid voice that is inside of you. So like, that's the thing with Feast Over Hammond, where it's like, you can keep having goals and keep achieving goals. 
the, the thing I think you're hearing is not the goal, but the serve the voice that creates the goal. That's really the thing. And that thing's inside of you, and it's, it's, it's an internal world game. And its fruits are external world realization. And then I, I quote this Jerry Roberts lyric, or it might just be Jerry, where it's like in I'll Take a Melody off 1976 Reflection. He's like, I'm, I'm living in yesterday's tomorrow. I know something is helping me along. I think that lyric is like the poetic explanation of that whole like philosophical rambling. No, that's beautiful, man. So if you're, if accolades are not the, the finish line per se, yeah. then what is, what is the end goal of being the best guitarist ever? Like, what does that look like to you? Yeah, I think best just starts to become a quiver in the arrow of what it means in its totality. I just want to be one of the most felt guitarists ever. Mm. That's where I'm at now. I just want to be one of the most felt ones. That's really it. It's like to feel is to be alive. Because you're reacting to the present moment and it's captured you in some way. Yeah, that's really the thing because music creates space and time. Mm. It's like what Robert Hunter said when he accepted one of his awards years ago. A song, a, a song comes in the time of its own, the time it helps to create. I just want to be one of the most felt players that we've ever won. And I think that is where the, the Japanese or the Eastern approach of it being a lifelong practice, that you're constantly compounding and being in an open relationship with. Open not in terms of like anything like like in a sexual way, but I mean in like a, uh, an objective way, you know, and that's hard, mm-hmm. really hard. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a career. It's not a job. It doesn't turn off at not. It doesn't start at nine and turn off at five. Like it's on all the time. And that's cool. I like that responsibility. I like that being on my back. And it's very meaningful. I just want to be one of the most stealth players of all time. Well, I mean, considering you're Nashville based and I mean, Nashville is, no stranger to extraordinary talent, whether it's songwriting, guitar playing, or any other number of things. How intimidating is it to have these visions and this this ultimate weight that you're talking about when you're in the midst of these giants? I don't know. I think a lot of it's still internal. I think, you know, we, we have a collective community of consciousness that we all share that is concentric from circle to circle. So like a smaller circle, medium circle, large circle, XL circle double XL circle, 33 XL circle. It's like in, in somewhere in the domain of those circles is the collective of community. And so there is indeed like a, there is a pressure, I think at first, but I've just, I've spent enough time listening to myself and like reflecting and talking to people that are meaningful in my life to realize that this really is like a, behind it all is your world. No matter what city you live in, what house you grew up in, what, you know, what, what fucked up things happened to you in your childhood or, or lack thereof, it doesn't matter. You are in your own world, ultimately, when it all breaks down to something else. And so I think like following the impulses that are discovered through that world, definitely over time, if you're trying to hit the right bullseye for me, those outweigh the man-made impulses from the collective community. Man-made impulses being like wanting to have a, you know, a certain virtue to like look cool in front of a party on, on like, you know, music row hang or something like that. The, all those things would be great. It's ultimately not the thing like I'm striving for. Um, and it, that's the whole point of music is that it's a, it's a man-made, at least for me, it's one of the points. It's, it's a man-discovered thing. And so with the discovered element, is there's a potential that's infinite to discover yourself and why wouldn't you want to discover yourself over everything else hmm. discover the wonders of nature of yourself you know that's what it's about for me with the thinking about those impulses and just you know especially in the vein of the grateful dead yeah. how does that translate musically how do you how do you follow that on stage that's a good question um you know it's off stage and on stage and they both inform themselves because there's similar worlds to the nexus of my mind. Even though like the physical domains are different, it's still my mind at play. When I wake up and I'm not playing and I'm home and I'm still playing, but I'm not on stage that night or we're not on stage. It's like when I'm on stage, 
fill my psyche. So it's always, it's, I think it, it actually is incredibly simple, so much so to the fact that it's incredibly deceiving of how simple it is, where it, it really is just listening to you. I like to call that the self with a capital S. Self. The self has always been there. It's why we like love kids, like when we see kids. And we like love their tenacity and we love who they are. And it's because they, through like some weird frequency of energy, they're so themselves that it is a beacon of light to the self that is latent within your own soul. And that's when we see an artist come and captivate a room in a timeless way, like Springsteen. It's like, well, he's 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 activated the self into whatever state that he's in. And I'm just trying to do that all the time. And it's it's, it's you know, depending on like what your personality is, it's easier or harder for some people. Like there's a, there's a very valid founded dichotomy of people that are intuitive versus people that are thinking. Uh, Cause intuition is in some ways a lack of, if you're delegating any conscious thought to what is like an autonomic thought that's latent within you. So it's like the things that you were born knowing that you never had to learn. Those are the things that fascinate me. What was I born knowing that I never had to learn? Well, a lot of that's being myself. And so that's the thing that um, is pushing. That is the variable. It, it, it sounds like you have to check a lot of ego. I mean, you've made several you know, comments in humility. I mean, there's a lot of ego check in this. The ego is a very fascinating thing. So it's like people in the West have a way of doing it. And then there's a lot of variables under that umbrella. And there's like an Eastern approach to the ego as well that has a lot of umbrella or under the umbrella or, or several methods. I like the concept. This is more Western. There was like integrating, like integrating the ego. Um, not, it's kind of a, uh, a very masculine short sighted thought to think that you can just take the ego off. In my opinion, it's like, okay, take your hands off your body. Yeah. Leave that at the door. It's like, no way, you know, like take your eyes off your body. No way. You're not going to do that. You're going to literally hurt yourself and go to the ER of Vanderbilt Medical. <laughs> it's like, but integrate your ego because that, th- that thing is here to stay. It's about integrate it and, and um, listen to it and be noble and be serving of it because it'll work with you if you can work with it in a way that's within your nature. It is not within our nature to take things off of us that were already within us a lot of the time for most people. You know, you're born with a, a physic, physical being and then a psychic being. And part of that, first aid kit of just being as a starter pack as being a human is the ego. So I like to just say to integrate the ego. Yeah, that's really the thing. And the way I just do that is, um, I mean, I don't do it well all the time, especially at 27. But I'm trying all the time and I'm being patient with myself. I have this kind of mantra. I like, I love three and I love alliteration. And so I love uh, patience, persistence, positivity. At any given moment, it took me, it took me 25 years of living uh, and like being my own person and like having traumatic episodes to realize that those three fuels can fuel your vehicle when you're on the lost highway of life at any given moment in, in a way that will be appreciative as opposed to depreciative, you know, and Victor Frankl says it best is um, the, the true lowest common denominator of human freedom is um, that nobody can take away from you literally ever is to control how you feel about any situation that you're in you you know no matter what it is against you you at some point whether it's a diminished percentage or not you have the free will to observe your situation and think about how you are feeling and control that to a degree and so patience persistence positivity really kind of scimitars through the the evergreen foliage of the ego in a nice way and it can lead you to a brilliant garden especially on the plat through the vehicle of music where does the balance of ego and confidence and then with you're talking about positivity also gratitude come into play i mean you you mentioned earlier you had you're talking about you were just bragging on your band so where does that all play in how does that fit Confidence and ego. Um, we 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 brush egos all the time. Even just this morning, we were doing our first session of listening back to one of our live shows, and we just started putting. Uh, we are essentially broadcasting Cosmic Country, the TV channel, and every uh, 
the streaming channel, really. You can go listen to any show we do. And we, it's in, you know, really high quality recording and um, mixed really well. And we were listening back to one of them. And one virtue that I've been wanting, uh, one value I've been wanting us to integrate more, which we all agree on, is patience and space and pocket. Because Cosmic Country is it's danceable, it's exploratory, and it's enchanting. That's the vision statement. It's exploratory and enchanting. But first, I want it to be danceable, which is an inclusive energy. And so we were listening back, and there was some ego brushing there. There was asking, there was an asking of some hard questions. Mm. And what confidence, when I think how confidence relates to the ego, at least in my experience, which is, hum, is, which is humble, is that the more that you can really look at the beast that your ego is and love it and also have it on a form-fitted leash, that is confidence. That is confidence. Being able to look your own insecurities in the eyes, and then also your brothers of the of the road with you in the eyes, and them and them to you, them to you. Uh, Daniel, you started that song too fast, or you you know you you blew the load too fast, euphemistically speaking, on that solo on that jam, and you know damn right if I I really did, I you know, and so that's it for me. So I mean, as the as the namesake of the band, as the name on the marquee, as well as just being an absolute guitar shredder you know that's out front ripping it in the you know in the jams how do you balance collaborating in a band while still taking your moment in the spotlight you know so if we of a vision that i'm moving towards or a goal of it rather is to give it away i've kind of i'm realizing now that like i've built a, an image of myself that i really love and i'm really proud of it which is a, like a virtuosic um, high level guitar player, you know, with, with vibe and, and it brings people to the present moment and all that. And if I look at a lot of what my heroes did is they were um, inside and outside of music. They were able to, so that's something that I have. What I want to do is take that identity and give it away and integrate it into a platform. And so artistically, with, with names being on the marquee, um, I, 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 we we're recording a record this winter with Vance Powell, one of my favorite producers in the galaxy. And I, it's going to be the first release that is um, Cosmic Country. It's not going to be Daniel Donato. Because it's a platform now. It's something that I'd rather be part of something that could be bigger than me and then not just be me. That's a that's something that we're moving towards. And I'm glad we can talk. This is what I love about podcasts is that it's life in real time. You know, this is a goal for my vision that, you know, who knows two years, three years from now, after this record's out, someone's gonna be listening to it. They'll be like, fuck. <laughs> I heard, you know, I heard Dan talking about, you know, when he now it's just an idea and that it hasn't happened yet, you know, and then here it is years later. Um, and so that's to answer one part of the question. Let's let's go to the second part of the question with taking a spot in the spotlight. Yeah, man. So if we look at the word light, um, where light initially comes from in the early days of humanity is before the genius of Nikola Tesla, Thomas Edison, more so Nikola Tesla with AC. We had a uh, we had light come from the sky, um, and in the sky through our own unconscious contents and desires we were able to look into the sky and form symbols out of certain spots of light. <laughs> a spotlight is emulative of a star. A star stands in the man-made stage that is a spotlight. But the way that exists in nature, which is also how it exists in my unconscious, is that oftentimes stars can be part of the constellation. And then it's actually fascinating because you find yourself looking at constellations more so than you do singular stars. It's really anything like me when you find yourself in the state of awe under a, a great Tennessee night sky, you use singular stars to find your way to a constellation. And so that's the whole concept with the band is that it's a collective of stars. It's a collective, it's a constellation, and we all shine brightly. And whenever the moon that is of the present moment and where the sun is, which, which is the song, wherever those two are in tandem with each other, which is ever changing, Certain parts of the constellation shine differently than others. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's a collective of stars and it's a platform. Um, 
I hope that answers that. No, that's, that's beautiful, man. So, I mean, what I'm hearing is like, you really are, I mean, especially talking about finding space and everything, you really are wanting to move more towards the dead than what you've doing in the sense that you're freeing up the stage more for interpretations. I mean, does that mean you're going to be doing more jamming on stage now? Or are you still going to, I mean, you're pretty, you're overall song based in your live shows. Uh, you do a decent amount of jamming. So, I mean, are you opening it up more or what's it going to look like moving forward? I like how you mentioned the dead there. Cause it's like, they certainly are like the blue chip band. Like they're the ones that started that. But the thing that's true at the end of the day is that they started that thing. So it's, they were the first to discover that plot of land that had the oil in it, but there's still oil there. You know what I mean? And it's like, and that's the thing it being America and it being this country that where you can have all these dreams and philosophies incorporated to a platform. It's really me trying to channel in more and so into the forces and energy that that band was around and that fish is about and that, you know, Billy Strings is about and Deuce is about and, and pigeon playing ping pong is about, and, you know, it, and also uh, the kitchen dwellers. And there's so many modern acts that are touching in on it still, too. It's just as alive as ever. It's more alive than it's ever been. And so that's what I'm trying to get in on there and just set up a little cosmic country flag in that plot of land and, you know, build it and they will come, as my history teacher told me. That was one of the most profound things he ever told me was that. It was probably to tears when he said it. So, yeah, I, I would say that's. You know, talking about opening up more and doing that and jamming more, 100%. And that's the thing with song-based versus exploratory-based. That's why I mentioned danceable, enchanting, and exploratory. Uh, with Cosmic Country, like, it's, it's literally, a, it's a tale all the time with a, the whole formation of it is that it's of a yin and yang. Country being three chords in the truth, and it's, it's familiar. But exploratory is the, the embrace of the, of the journey of going into places that you've never gone before. And so we, we have a healthy equilibrium between the two. And each night's like a different makeup of that yin and yang, just like how each day is or how each season is. So it's really like going with the flow of nature. Well, I mean, and you even talking, I mean, just cosmic country in and of itself, it's a pretty foreign genre in a lot of ways. I mean, there are not, I cannot think of you and you may have some, but there are no country jam bands. I mean, the dead definitely touched on it in the early seventies, but I mean, that was more Americana. And I mean, you're definitely more in the straightforward country in a lot of ways genre. So, I mean, like, tell me about just the melding of the two genres in your mind. Yeah. You know, it's like, that's the thing too. It's like the efficacy of genres are definitely necessary to like, to guide your way through exploring new music and finding out what you might like, or you might use a genre to tell somebody what something sounds like. But all of those man-made words are just um, arrows that point you to the direction of a feeling. And a feeling is something that is discovered. And so, you know, there's plenty, you know, like Fish has so many country jams or bluegrass jams, really bluegrass jams. And the dead have both, you know, and then there's the kitchen dwellers and there's Billy Strings and, not to compare ourselves to externally to other people, because that's like a national fact. Just to kind of like give you a lay of the land, it's like the feeling that you get when you listen to a lot of those bands is something of a cosmic country sentiment. The, our brothers, the kitchen dwellers, call themselves Galaxy Grass. You know, and all, all of these, like all these branding, not only are they cool, they, they're fun for social media, they're fun for our community and making artwork and making albums around it. But really, they point to a similar collective feeling that we're all pulling from each other, which is kind of this like American sounding song that goes to a place you've never been before. And that's fascinating because when I say it in that way, a lot of bands start to kind of fit the cosmic the country dichotomy. It's wild. And so that's really what I'm getting at with it. Yeah. So, I mean, e even under that, under that mindset, you have artists like Sturgill Simpson and Margot Price that really fit into that really well, even though but, most people would be very remiss to say they're even jam band adjacent in any way. That's the great thing about jam bands, man. It's like the people, it's a frequency. And so it's like, I remember, I used to see Sturgill play at the five spot in that Robert's Western world in 2013 and 14, or 2012 and 13 for $5. And I wasn't old enough to get in. 
and the door guy would put like a a small straw in my Coca Cola to make it look like I had a cocktail because he was my buddy, so he would let me stay in. <laughs> He's like, go, go yeah. sit in the corner, don't say anything. That's awesome. It's like but when Sturgill's album, Meta Modern Sound, came out. I remember my friend Harry uh, went to Grimey's. We bought it for fourteen ninety nine. We went into his basement, right off of uh, right out of Berry Hill, and we smoked the biggest bong I have ever hit in my life. And I got so <laughs> remarkably high. I couldn't even open my phone, couldn't move. I couldn't do anything but open my eyes. And we just listened to that record. And it's so cosmic, that record, let alone the aesthetic on the album cover. And it's so country, let alone the aesthetic on the album cover. It's a classic yin and yang dichotomy. It's a, it's a, it's a tin type of Sturgill centered in an old country frame around a galaxy. And so his, his unconscious was leading leading to the same direction that mine is. And then the song, you know, I've seen Jesus play in a lake of fire that I was standing in. If you're going to open up the record with that lyric, that's immensely cosmic. Turtles all the way down, that's the universal, that's the concept of the world being atop of a turtle shell and it being atop of another turtle shell. And a turtle shell that is circular, which, you know, lends back to the point I mentioned earlier of the concentric circles of community. Like there's a community of universe consciousness and, un- and collective a lot of it's caused the country once you start to wear those glasses start to see it it's wild yeah so what's the balance for you of artists in that vein that are the Sturgill Simpsons and Margos and so on how much of that is influencing you comparatively to the dead I mean what's if you had to give it a ratio what would you say it is yeah and it's, it's good to to serve the quantitative tendency even though it might uh, not have the best efficacy in some moments. You know, I uh, a thing that my vision tells me is like my something needs to just feel more like my guitar playing. My guitar playing really feels like it really is a part of my soul that exists outside of space and time, and I can I can channel it and communicate those things from that guitar. And I want my songs to be able to do that more. And I think Sergio, like especially like his country songwriting, like specifically that first record or the second record, let alone when he became Sergio Simpson and he stopped with Sunday Valley. Um, yeah, those songs are like, those are songs he'll be singing forever. And then also Sailor's Guide to Earth. The songwriting on that record, that songwriting inspired me. I feel like I could stand to improve on those elements. But we're really excelling as a band that, like, I've toured with Marco. I've seen Sturgill play a lot, like a lot. And they more or less like have a show that they do that's kind of, they don't, there's not as much bandwidth to like let the present moment affect the way the show's going to go, which is totally cool. Um, and it's more entertaining than it is like a it's celebrating the present moment and embracing the perfection of the human imperfectness. Cosmic Country really excels in that. Like we, each night, like, is different. It's a different song. Like, no man steps in the same river twice, or he's a different man and it's a different river. And it's like, I really like that that virtue to be integrated in what we do. And that's the wild thing, is that the first time we ever jammed in, like, Noah and Nathan's basement, um, we recognized that because we were playing Jessica, the Allman Brothers song, and we went into this Phrygian, we went into the C-sharp major, Thing. and it was um or she sharp minor and it was like how in the world did we just get our four batteries of our minds together and create that kind of alternating current with each other like it, 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 there truly was like a phenomenon to it and those are the things that i think the dead they they built the biggest platform heard around the world probably the galaxy and gone of embracing that kind of value into their music so, you know, I would never want someone to come see five of our shows and see the same show every night. I, that's not me. It's not even who I am as a person. It's just it's me directly getting in the way with my nature. And then also with everyone else's nature that's on stage with me. And if we're a constellation and each star is 25%, then the other 75% is fucking important. <laughs> so, you know, just kind of where the cards fall, the cosmic cards, if you will. So, I mean, you've, you've talked about the, the visions 
of guitar playing majesty and just your, I mean, it's just plainly obvious how much you absolutely adore playing the guitar, but you briefly touched on it and said it maybe even passively about wanting to improve your songwriting. So where is that balance for you between becoming a better songwriter, but still doing the thing you love most? So because I, I also need to become a better guitar player. Like in this band, I have like a Ted Green chord book that like oftentimes like after a show, uh, I'll take it out from where it's folded. And I'll just read the chords. Just like use the instrument of my mind. Because it's really like the songwriting and the guitar playing are, they are nexus with each other to the ne- or the nexus of those two is the instrument of the mind. And so it's like always taking in. And I think like a healthy ratio of like, for everything that exists, like at least for me, it's like for everything that I learned, I want to like create something. So like we were talking earlier, it's like there's some songs that we've been covering in our set and they were realizing like why we're covering those songs because like they, in like a way of form, serve a rhythm for a certain genre or a certain story that our original content could stand to create. And so I think it's both. I think it's both. You know, always getting better. Like on guitar, like right now, I'm practicing like modal scale run up. So like within the key of A, you know, I could I could quite literally just run through. Yeah, I can do that. This one's hard. And like I'll be doing that in the van, like while we're just fucking around and listening. And then like maybe something like that one to two to three minor, you know, like in a different key, that'll inspire a song of mine, like like American Beauty, like. Like that whole chord progression. It's like they're they're totally tied together. And that's like part of the responsibility, like at least for me, like if you're a perpetual student, it's like being perpetually aware to the whispers of inspiration to see how you can tie things together. Because everything is everything. That's a which is born of the concept of feast over famine. Like, you know, during COVID, like I, I gave over four hundred guitar lessons. I I I saw this immense need for people to take that time and to do something meaningful with it. And I put out the opportunity to the world to sit down with people one on one and zoom and see what they wanted to get better at. And a lot of the time people have a, they have a weird relationship with creating and then taking in things, which is what a student does is takes in things. But a student also, after your apprenticeship with a mentor has been achieved, it's your job then to go out into the world on your own accord and create your own domain with things that you've learned. Um, so you're learning and creating perpetually. This is how it works. It's like oxygen. I'm taking in carbon. I'm taking in oxygen and putting out carbon, you know, and it's, it's just the way it goes. It's for everything you take in, you put it back out, you give it away. You surrender the breath and then you surrender the thing that you've learned to something that you created and, and it was a way that's integrated with your ego. You put it out into the world. You give it away to the environment of nature. That's the whole trip. That's part of it. For me. No, no, man, that's, that's absolutely wonderful. Uh, and I think that's a wonderful place to end the conversation because that was just beautiful. So I'm going to give you a second. Is there anything you want to plug? Where can people find you? Where, uh, where can people hear some more Daniel Donato? Oh yeah. Everywhere. Spotify, uh, Instagram, and the most importantly, uh, YouTube and Doug. We're always putting up live videos like one a week on YouTube. They saw our, our, uh, photographer and videographer makes these amazing videos. And then on Doug, we put our first batch of shows up there. And right now we're doing a, like a thing called Trippy Thursdays, which you're probably going to keep doing as long as we can, which is three songs every Thursday. Three is the magic number. And it's just putting those out. Yeah, yeah. And then also, you know, do you have any more of those rapid questions? I, I know you had a few more of those. You want to get those on. Them. <laughs> oh, yeah. So, yeah, uh, you, I mean, we kind of touched on it. The, the other two were, uh, if you could borrow the talent of one songwriter for a day, who would you pick? Robert Hunter. Ah, uh, yeah, that's a good one. You can't go wrong with him. I, have you seen uh, Long Strange uh, Trip, the documentary, right? I have. My friend Eric Eisner 
Cobb. That was his whole brainchild for that documentary. I know that documentary very well. That's very cool. One of my absolute favorite scenes in any movie or whatever is when they sit him down and they ask him to explain Dark Star. And he's just like, what's there to explain? It's pretty self-explanatory, man. Like, that's one of the best things I've ever seen in my entire life. Yeah, yeah. And it's crazy. If you read the lyrics, they're way, I think that's what he was getting at. He was like, if you read the lyrics and you empathize with them and be them, they, they really are. It's just, it's just because it's self-explanatory, it takes away from the phenomenology of the concrete fact that his mind came up with those lyrics. And he, he and his views penned those down to paper. That's fucking insane. Well, Daniel, I have thoroughly enjoyed our conversation today, man. I really appreciate you taking the time out to talk to me, man. Hell yeah. I love it, man. I love talking. I talk too much. <laughs> no, dude, you talk, you talk yeah, well. Right oh, but yeah. Let me, uh, let me, plug, let me plug the Lost Highway podcast too, which is like the podcast of all things cosmic country. Yes, do it. Um, different interviews, different people. We're going to, before this run is over, we're on an 11 day run. We were talking about doing this concept of like everyone who's in the van with us, like Joe, Easton, Nathan, Noah, Will, Face Dog isn't here, but we all sit down and and myself and we just have a podcast and have fun but those will be coming on there too but it's like the podcast format of the musical companion that's called the country that's awesome man well dude daniel again thank you so much man i've really had a blast today i wish you the absolute best man you've got a lot you've got a very bright future i can tell you that thanks thank you inspiration moves me bright for sure i'm lance ingram and this is yesterday's concert Thanks for tuning in to another show. Sources and more information on today's show are available on our website, yesterdaysconcert.com. While you're there, check out some old episodes or connect with us on Twitter, at ConcertPod, or on Instagram, at Yesterday's Concert. And until next time, take care of your shoes.